All right, we are to the final message in this series. We, we're calling the series Un, that's what we've called it, because we're looking at a group of people in Judges that were unfaithful, they were unholy, they were undeserving, they were unreliable, yet they served a God who was unstoppable, a God who had unending mercy and grace. And so we're now to the very last message in the series. Go all the way to the last verse of the chapter. Judges chapter 21. Drop down to verse 25 or just go to the book of Ruth and back up one chapter. Back to that last verse. Judges chapter 21 verse 25. Judges 21 verse 25. It says, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Let's read it one more time. In those days, Israel had no king. Everybody say, no leadership. They had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Father, I come to you this morning, and I'm asking you to take your word and use it to speak to your people, to transform your people, to renew their minds. Let me not just share my opinions or what I might have learned from my study of the Word, but God, let me be a tool that you can use to bring about revelation from your Word and regeneration in your people's lives. And I thank you and I praise you. Take your Word and transform our hearts, and we receive your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. It said, in those days Israel had no king. They had no leadership. No one was leading. They had no positive influencers. My first thing I want to point out is the fact they had no leaders. They had no one to be a strong, positive influencer. I mention this all the time because I think it's a powerful statement that John Maxwell made. He said, leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. I love that definition of leadership. And unfortunately, at this point, even though Deborah has tried to rescue them and you know, they've had Gideon to try and rescue them. Ahud has tried to rescue them. All these different people have tried to rise up and save the nation. In the end, we see they have no king, no savior, no leader, no positive influencer. The story is told of General William Sheridan's Union troops as they were being badly beaten by the Confederate soldiers, and they'd gotten trapped in, a, in sort of a corner. And they all started to get up and gallop away and retreat when suddenly... General Sheridan stood up in his bootstraps and yelled to his retreating soldiers, Men, the battle is this way. I thought that's pretty funny. Guys, the battle is this way. And then he took off and he ran toward or rode toward the enemy. At that point, all of his troops looked at each other, turned their horses around, and followed the general into the battle. And they ended up winning the battle. Why did they win the battle? Because they had a strong influencer. I want to tell you something, folks. We need strong influencers. We need, you need strong influencers in your life. I often say everybody needs a pastor. Why do you need a pastor? You need somebody that will influence you to do what God's Word says. Why do you need partners in life, people that will pray with you and study the Word with you and hold you accountable? Why do you need accountability partners? We need influencers. Why do kids need parents involved in their life? Those kids need influencers. I'm telling you, a home without a strong positive influencer will produce children full of turmoil and anxiety and fear. It will produce all kinds of problems. We need influencers, not just powerful influencers. We need positive influencers. Our nation is filled with powerful influencers, but we don't have enough positive influencers. I mean, our role models today in the U.S. are Miley Cyrus and Bruce Jenner, the Kardashians and the Bachelorette. I know some of you ladies love that show, but my word, that's the dumbest show ever. I'm going to make out and do all kinds of things with 25 different men, and I'm pretty sure at the end of two weeks I'm going to be in love with one of them. That is just the dumbest thing ever. That's our role models. I might have been on the flesh, but that was probably good flesh there that I said that. I mean, really, truly, we, these are the people we're looking up to. Immoral Hollywood celebs, immoral athletes that just because they're on TV every Sunday or they knock balls out of a ballpark or they, or they manage to put a hockey puck through a net or a soccer ball into a net, we look up to them. And what we really need are not more 
Not, not more overindulged celebrity athletes. We need more Kurt Warners, and we need more Tim Tebow's. Praise God. We need some positive influencers who will say, listen, what makes me great is not the fact that I had a hit record or I managed to land a TV show or I play professional sports. The only thing that can really make you great is a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 2. It says, where there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily. Now, does that not scare all of you Americans just a little bit like me? Man, that is scary as an American. I look at the moral rot in our nation, and it makes you realize just like a house that's been eaten up with termites, that's rotten by water damage, there's a possibility that building could collapse. And listen, our nation is in desperate need of great leadership. Our, our, not, just, not just somebody new to be elected president or governor or, or congressman or senator. We need the body of Christ to rise up and say, I will be salt and light in this world. I will be the influencer. Proverbs 29 verse 4 says, a just king gives stability to his nation. We need some people to rise up and make our nations stable. We need, we need husbands and wives to rise up and make the homes stable. We need, we need Christians, church leaders to rise up and make the church stable. Everyone needs positive influencers in their life. Praise God. Not only did they have a lack of positive influencers, they had perception-based principles. They had perception-based principles. Going back to that last verse of Judges, it says, everyone did as they saw or as they perceived, as they saw fit. They looked at a situation and based on their human perception, which is oftentimes molded by and conforms to our ungodly desires that we may have. He says, they did as they saw fit. Don't let your perception determine your principles. Don't let your, your mere human perception of what's going on in the earth help you determine what principles should or should not be because shifting standards will keep you unstable. Proverbs 12 verse 13 says, Wickedness never brings stability, but the godly have deep roots. You need roots deep into the solid, dependable Word of God. I like this uh, statement William Penn made. He said, Right is right, no matter who's against it, and wrong is wrong, no matter who's for it. Now that kind of differs from the 35% of Americans who say there are no absolute standards. Isn't that, isn't that sad? 30, one, more than one out of every three people in America, not at Life Church, but in the, the rest of our nation, one out of every three or more say there's really no absolute standards. There's no definite sins. There's no definite right. Or wrong, but I want to tell you that is absolutely teetotally wrong. Elbow your neighbor and say that be very, very wrong. What we've got to do, we've got to decide the Bible isn't just a good book, it's a God book. It's the God book. Amen? It's not just a good book, it's God's book. It's His Word. Forty men living in different time periods, in different regions, came together and penned 66 books, totaling over 30,000 verses, and every one of them are in agreement. I bet I couldn't get you to come into complete agreement with your best friend. I doubt most of you married couples completely agree about everything in your marriage. But somehow, somehow all of these 40 men could write things in perfect unison. Why? Because it's not the words of men. It was words inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's God's Word. It's His book. And His book is what determines what's right and what's wrong. And that's what determines our principles. Not what we think or see with our own eyes or what we feel or the relationships we have with other people. What determines right or wrong is the Word of God. Praise the Lord. The Word of God is what determines if things are right or wrong. Another thing we see about these Israelite people in the book of Judges, and let's be honest, about many people in America, many people in the church as well, they were passive about those principles. They were passive about the principles of life, the principles of God. The next real leader, if you want to call him that, that we'll find you got to fast forward over to 1 Samuel and you'll come across a guy who is a priest by the name of Eli. He's kind of sort of the next leader 
uh, uh, that will pop up. And uh, Eli, however, according to 1 Samuel 2, verse 11 and 12, he had sons who were scoundrels. Interesting word there. His sons were scoundrels. They were bad guys. They were horrible people. Verse 17, it says that these, the sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. Verse 22, now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything. Notice he heard about everything everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, now that's an important statement. He didn't do anything. He said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about the wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear is not good. You guys stop doing that. Pretty please. Please be good. You, you want to? Can I tell you what? You should not have to tell your children. Pretty please obey me. Pretty please stop uh, hurting somebody. Pretty please stop screaming in the middle of Walmart. Pretty listen. You need to. You need to learn to, that that discipline and doing the right thing is more than just talk. It's action. Eli said what you're doing is bad, but he never did anything about it. He was passive. He just let the sin continue. He never, other than say a few words, he never really addresses the situation. And thus, he was a negative influence through his negligence. He was negative through negligence. He knew it was wrong, but he never bothered to share with somebody. Hey, you got to stop. He never took any actions. Can I, can I share something with your parents? It's your job to raise up godly children. It's not children's church's job. It's not your Sunday school teacher's job. It's not your public school teacher or private school teacher's job. It's your job to raise up godly children. And God says, listen, do what you've got to do to make sure that they understand the principles they must build their life upon. He was a whole lot of talk, but not a whole lot of action. And uh, we can't have that. Verse, verse 29, God comes to Eli and says, why do you scorn my sacrifice? Eli probably said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. I never did that. And God probably said, no, you did do it because you did nothing to stop it. Therefore, you were compliant. You were a part of this. And God says, you, you, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribe for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons? Notice, he kept on honoring the sons who were doing wrong. Can I tell you, we are guilty. Even in the body of Christ, we're guilty of honoring people who are not living for God. We are honoring people who are not living for God. And let me tell you, there is a price for passivity. There's a price for being passive. James chapter 4, verse 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. For you to know that you ought to do something and not do it, that puts you right there uh, just as, just as uh, in the wrong as anyone else. God says, when you know to do something, do something about it. Have you, have you had the news on it all this week or picked up a newspaper or flicked on one of the news things on, on your phone or your mobile device? You heard about Harvey Weinstein. Is that how you say the guy's name? Weinstein, Weinstein, whatever. I don't know how you say the name, but I do know this. For the last, what, 20, 30 years or whatever, women have been being violated. They've been being uh, abused and raped and all kinds of terrible things have gone on. However, there were lots of people that knew about it. There were lots of his friends, co-workers, celebrities that knew about it. They were aware of it. Some of them even saw him do it, but they said nothing. They said, well, you know, we might lose our jobs. Even some of the victims, and that I get, okay, they were traumatized you know, I get that, but both victims and friends and co-workers alike said, well, you know what? I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to affect my career in Hollywood, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Folks, that is absolutely wrong. We must stand up for the principles of God. Right is right, no matter who is against it, and wrong is wrong, no matter who's for it. Praise the Lord. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of God the earth. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Everybody say, I got to be salt. Look at your neighbor and say, be salty. One of the latest slang words that have come out, I think it's popular maybe among 
preteens, teenagers, is if somebody's being hateful or kind of mad, you say, well, they're salty, and they're turning salty into a bad thing. There's nothing wrong about being salty. Salty is what we should be as Christians, praise God. Not, not mean or hateful, uh, but we're called to be salty. Reader's Digest did an article, and they put out 60 things that salt is useful for, and they didn't come anywhere close to nailing all of them. But here's a few of the things salt is good for. It will preserve meat. You see, when we're the salt of the earth, we can preserve our families. We can preserve our nation, our culture. We're called to be a preservative. Praise God. It will improve the taste of food. We ought to improve the situation wherever we go. We ought to be a positive influence on everyone around us. It will sanitize and kill bacteria. Listen, when you walk into a room, people ought to stop cussing. When you get involved in somebody and become uh, a friend of theirs... Their life ought to begin to change. Suddenly, sins they used to commit, they ought to stop committing it because that's what salt does. Salt kills the germs and the bacteria. It will remove watermarks from furniture. I mean, as, as the salt of the earth, we ought to bring improvement and healing to people. Praise God, we're the salt. It will, re, uh, it will kill grass and weeds. But just a warning, before you go out and put that on the weeds in your yard, understand, when, once you put the salt down, my understanding is nothing will grow there for like the next two years. So just beware. I took pastor's advice in the sermon. I don't have any grass anymore. I warned you, okay? It will melt snow and ice. Okay, if you take salt water and you soak a napkin with it, wrap it around your cheese, guess what? Your cheese won't mold as quickly. It'll keep your cheese fresh. It will condition your skin. How many of you have been bombarded at the mall by the lady who wants to sell you the salt rub, right? Oh, come, come. It'll make your hands softer. And uh, the list just goes on and on and on. Salt is good. And God says, you should be the salt of the earth. We're called not to be passive. We're called to make a difference. So being passive and having perception-based principles are not good. And ultimately what that does, it gives birth to what I want to call majority morality. It gives birth to majority morality. But when you decide, well, if the majority of people are for it, it must be good. Let me once again remind you of William Penn's statement. Right is right no matter who's against it. Wrong is wrong no matter who's for it. But majority morality says if the majority vote and say it's okay, if the majority live that way, then it must be all right. That is so very, very wrong. Can I tell you something? We are about this close to having legalized euthanasia of elderly people in our nation. You don't believe me? We've already got six states that have passed laws approving assisted suicide. It's legal in six states. You, you think, well, it's too far-fetched? I would have thought back in, what, 1970, when was Roe versus Wade? 1974, is that right? 1974, they passed a law, and the majority said, you know what, it's okay if you want to put to death an unborn child. Folks, before long... You know, if we keep going, if we, if we cease to be salt, what's going to happen? Suddenly, you know what? Your mother-in-law is getting to be a problem. Not a problem. Just carry her by the doctor's office and have her put down. That's the way it's going to work. I sent my mother-in-law to the pound. They put her down last week. No. No, it, not, okay, maybe that's not how it's going to work. But listen, this is what happened when the salt quits being salty. Well, you know, they're older, and, and with the Alzheimer's, it would just be better for them not to have to go through that. I mean, if we hadn't have done that, if we hadn't have went ahead and put them down, they would have really suffered with that cancer. Or, you know, they, they were in poverty, and so we kept them from having to live in poverty. That's what happens when you don't have a bedrock of principles called the Word of God. That's what happens when the body of Christ isn't salty like it should be. Suddenly, whatever the majority says is okay must surely be okay. Oh, my goodness. I am up. I'm 49 now. And I will, I, will, I will never die, but I'll never get older. I'm going to be 49 forever. But uh, maybe I'll just back up and be 39 forever. I don't know which. But in the last few years, something happened to me that, that really has bothered me. Because up until I was in my mid-40s, I had 2017 reading vision. And I still have like 2016 out there vision. If you want me to tell you what a sign says in Mount Juliet, open the back door and I can read that. But I need my fonts to be 372 on here. Make it big. And, uh, and the doctor, I go, to the, I go to the ophthalmologist, and he says, you know what, you need, you need reading glasses. And I don't remember. It's 1.5 or 1.75 magnification. That's what you need so that you can see clearly. Can I tell you, the world 
needs, you and I need the magnification of the Word of God if we're going to clearly see what's right and what's wrong. It's the Word of God that enables us to truly see what is right and what's wrong. Otherwise, you're going to adopt the mentality, well, if I'm just a little better than the majority, I must be very good. Uh, true story. Uh, a radio talk show in Atlanta, a conservative talk show, was interviewing people, and they were talking about what makes a person good, and a 17-year-old girl from an affluent, upper-middle-class family called in. And they got to, she got to talking, and this is what, I'll, I'll try to read it so I don't miss anything. Her name was Natalie. And she called in and she said, you know, she said, I, I'm a pretty good person. She said, I don't sleep around. I only have sex with the boys I'm dating at the time. She said, well, you know, I mean, I've had a lot of different partners, but still, I, I'm, I'm still a, a pretty good person. She said, and, and I don't drink alcohol very, very much. I mean, only, you know, I mean, except at parties, which is, you know, several times a week. And, you know, and I, I mean, I, I rarely ever drink before coming to school. Maybe once or twice a week, I'll have a little something to drink. And I mean, I don't smoke pot as much as most people do. I'll smoke pot a few times a week. And again, I, I never do that before school unless maybe once or twice a week I might. And when I do come to school stoned, it's okay. The teachers never say anything about it. So it's really not a big deal. And she goes, I mean, I'm not like those people who mix pot with LSD, which is really popular. And it really works. It does a great job. But I don't do that very often. I don't usually mix LSD with my pot. And then listen to what she said. She said, I'm not bad. Not like others. I think I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed anybody. I know it's wrong to do drugs, but you know, it's, it's, if it's the only thing I, I do wrong, well, I, that still makes me a, a pretty good person. Sure, I have sex with people, but I don't murder anybody. I haven't killed anybody yet. The announcer was stunned. And the, the announcer said, are you telling me because you haven't killed anyone, that makes you a good person. Matter of factly, she said, yep, it sure does. Wow. But listen, folks, 17-year-old Natalie is not alone. That's what happens when you have majority morality. As long as I am a little better than the worst people, that makes me a good person. But God says, no, 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 no. I don't want you measuring your life based on how everybody else lives. Measure your life according to my word. Praise the Lord. Measure your life according to my word. Throughout the book of Judges, we saw this. Judges constantly conformed to the culture that was around them. Whatever, whatever enemy they were around, they would conform to that group, to that country, to that lifestyle. Let me give you three types of conformers. Three types of conformers. There are connection conformers. Connection conformers. You conform because people you're connected to live that way. I mean, after all, my son or my daughter, they're, they're a good person. And so they're, what they're doing can't be that wrong. My best friend lives that way. And you know what? I know a lot of Christians that are a lot worse off than they are. So, you know, I don't think there's really that much wrong with the sin they're committing because I know them and I'm friends or I'm related to them. I, and I love them and you let your love and your affection for them shape how you feel about that sin. Listen, I don't care if it's your best friend. I don't care if it's your spouse, your kid, or who it is. If it's sin, it is sin. Praise the Lord. Up all your neighbor and say, that was the wrong place to be quiet. You should have shouted, Amen. There are connection conformers. There are comfort conformers. I conform so that my life is comfortable. I conform to the things that I like. Doesn't necessarily mean they're right. Doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong. I just want to take the path of least resistance and live the way that pleases me. But I think we need to be more like Moses who said he was willing to forsake the pleasures of of sin for a season to be able to live with godly people and live a life that honored his God. Comfort conformers say, you know what, if it's pleasing, if it's enjoyable, then surely God must not mind it. I hear people say this all the time. Well, I, I, this is what I know, Pastor. I know what I did was wrong, but I also know God wants me to be happy. Anyway, I don't think God is saying, you know what, just go ahead and murder Bob Zod. If that would make you happy, if that would really make you happy, you know, to steal from, from Sarah, go ahead and just steal from Sarah. After all, that would make you happy. No, no, no. No matter, no matter who's for it, no matter who's against it, right is right and wrong is wrong. 
There's no gray areas, okay? There's not 50 shades of gray or any shade of gray. It's right or it is wrong. Somebody say amen. amen. There are circumstance conformers. And I think probably all of us have been in this situation at some point. 65% of Americans say morality depends on the circumstance. They believe whether something's right or wrong is dependent on the circumstance. That is a lie from the pits of hell. That is so not true. Right is always right, and wrong is always wrong, okay? But you know what? Say, well, I mean, I, I can't forgive them because they really haven't changed. That's not what Jesus didn't say. You know what? If you think they're changing, if you think maybe they're not an Alabama fan anymore, then go ahead and forgive them. No, I'm just kidding. Congratulations, Alabama fans. All right. That was a good win. No, you can't say, well, you know what? If I hadn't taken vengeance, they were just going to do somebody wrong again. No, no, no. The Bible says vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not yours. I don't care how bad you think they are. Well, it's either killed or be killed. Take or be taken. And so I know. Stop making excuses. Stop looking at your circumstances and trying to make up excuses. Well, you know what? I, I just, I just, you know, I, yeah, I get drunk a lot, but that's what gets me through the day because I have so much stress in my life. No, 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 no. Sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. Right is right. Everybody say right is right. Can I tell you one of my least favorite cartoons and, and uh, uh, movie scripts of all time? Robin Hood. Can I tell you why I don't like Robin Hood? Because Robin Hood says stealing is okay as long as I take what I steal and I give it to somebody in need. If I take from the rich and I give to the poor, then that makes it right. No. The Bible says thou shalt not steal. Period. It didn't say thou shalt not steal unless you're stealing from Bill Gates or thou shalt not steal unless you're stealing from this wealthy person. No. It's thou shalt not not steal. No more Robin Hood syndrome. Stop making excuses for your sin. And if you got sin in your life, just repent of it. Praise the Lord. I'll elbow your neighbor and say, well, pastor's getting all over you today. No more conforming to culture. No more majority morality. No more perception-based principles. Everybody say, no more conforming. Say, no majority morality. No perception-based principles. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to this world. Be transformed by your God. What do we see from Judges chapter 1 all the way through Judges chapter 21? We see people who continually conformed to the culture instead of transforming the culture and being transformed by God. But I want to end with some good news. Can I end with some good news? The primary message of Judges. I want to give you the primary message of Judges. And the praise team can come back up. The prayer team can come. As we go through the book of Judges, what we see in every chapter and every verse is that there are no humans capable of of fully saving us. Deborah could not save Israel when she led them. She won some battles. She helped them. But ultimately, they went back to their idols. They went back to their sin. Ahud won a battle, but he could not completely deliver the Israelites. They went back to their idols. They went back to sin. Gideon managed to come in and win some battles for them. But guess what? After Gideon, they went back to their sin. And by the time you get to Samson, the people aren't even repenting of their sin. They're comfortable in their chaos. They're comfortable in their, in their, uh, in their sin and their, their lifestyle of, of the culture around them. So ultimately, we see that none of the people, no human on earth, was ever able to deliver them. And I'm going to tell you, no human is able to deliver you. That's why God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Hello? Listen to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. God looked down at all of us and said, You know what? I don't see any way that you in your own strength as a human, you'll never be able to overcome the temptation of sin. You'll never be able, you'll never be able to fully be set free. No human can ever fix all of your problems. So Titus 3, verse 3, it says, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, and de deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passion and pleasures. Notice it said we too. 
Listen, the, the, uh, the ancient Israelites are not the only people that were enslaved by stuff, right? You and I were enslaved by our sin, by our passions, by our, our desire for pleasure. It says we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. He didn't just win a battle for us. He didn't just take care of a few problems for us. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Good news. God looked at your life and said, you know what? They don't have the strength to save themselves, and there's not a human on the earth that has the strength to save them. So I will send the perfect one. I'll send my only begotten son, and he will die on the cross for you so that you can have eternal life. Not because you deserve it, not because you can somehow earn it, but just out of his grace and his mercy and his wonderful love for you, he set you free. You look at the Israelites throughout the book of Judges. God never sends a Savior to them because they deserved it. Most of the time, they were crying out for, for help, but they were in that situation because they chose to rebel against God. And then as soon as He delivers them, give them a couple of years, they'd go right back to the idols. God never sent saviors because they deserve saviors. He sent saviors to deliver them from situations because He loved them and He cared about them because He's rich in mercy. And the same thing is true throughout history. We didn't really choose Him. The Bible says He chose us. Amen? He chose you. And He looked at you and said, even if you can't fix your problems, that's okay. Even, if you, even though you caused your problems, that's okay. I love you. Can I give you some good news this morning? God loves you, period. He loves you. Are you a, are you a royal mess up? Maybe, but He loves you anyway. Are, are, are you bound by a thousand chains? Maybe so. But He still loves you and He still sent a Savior who wants to set you free. God made a way, as the old psalm goes, the old chorus goes, God made a way where there was no way. God made a way for you. Jesus loves you. Praise the Lord.